I'm in the area of Martin County known as the Islands. In 1957, one of E.J. Hayes High School former students uh, came down here to pick up uh, one of his classmates and they were going back to A&T University. He didn't know that it was a, a group of uh, sheriff department people here waiting for him because they had heard a black man was going to meet a white woman in this area. And since this car was just like the man they thought was coming, they opened fire on Joe Cross, an uh, E.J. Hayes graduate who worked part-time at Virginia Beach and other places so he could finance his college education. And he was home one weekend, and he came to pick up another student who went to Hayes and was at that time going to A&T University. Uh, and this is where he met his death. He was shot more than one time. Uh, the sheriff of Martin County and a group of his deputies were involved. This is one of the tragic moments that happened during a time when African Americans were shot at will. The tragic situation that happened here went unsolved. Uh, nobody was prosecuted for it. Uh, it just went on and on. Uh, his body was taken to a white undertaker. And uh, during that time and today, black people, when they die, don't go to white undertakers. So that was a mystery, too. So they contacted the black undertaker, uh, J.D. Everett, to see why this took place. Why did the body go to the white undertaker? So J.D. Uh, went and looked at the body and whatever he said, the black community took. He described what he saw and it wasn't long before the case was closed. But the question remains, why after the killing of Joe Cross did they take the body to a white undertaker? As I stand here where Joseph Cross was killed, I wonder which one of these trees would have been here during the time that this took place. It could have been this one here, since it's the biggest one that I see. If only that tree could talk, and we could find out what actually happened in 1957 when Joe Cross came through here to pick up a fellow student to go back to a and University. I'm now standing in front of uh, uh, Skewarki Church. Uh, this was the name of Winston years ago uh, without the E. The Y was over here and it was named after the Indians. It was an Indian name. The area where E.J. Hayes High School played football. And directly behind the football field is Skewarki Primitive Church. You can see how old this uh, building is, 1787. Skewarki is an old Indian name. In fact, Williamson used to be called Skewarki with a Y on the end. And over the years, they changed the name. Uh, back over here, this was also known as a lynching ground where mobs of white people would kill people. Okay? Uh, 
there was a Jew that was castrated uh, back here for, he was being accused of uh, raping a white woman. Uh, during that same time, uh, my great grandfather had his head cut off in this area. He was robbed. Uh, he was an ambitious black man. There was a gold watch missing. And somewhere in this area, there was also a bar. I'm standing next to what was once E.J. Hayes High School, which was started in 1924 for African-American children. And it ended in 1970 when integration came. And uh, E.J. Hayes was turned into an elementary school. And they stopped using this school, which is now uh, in the hands of the Alumni Association. All the graduates, or some of them from E.J. Hayes, decided to lease the building and turn it into a communication area for kids or a place for kids to be involved with academic activities. This is where the principal used to be, W.A. Holmes, who took over in 1952 uh, after Edgar James Hayes, who the school was named after, uh, retired. Uh, E.J. Hayes, of course, began with Principal uh, Edgar James Hayes in 1924 and uh, in 1969, Edgar James Hayes died. Most of the students didn't know that he was living, the students that were here during that time. Mr. Holmes was a dynamic leader who brought many outstanding speakers to commencement, including Samuel Proctor, uh, Benjamin Mays, and Dowdy, Louis Dowdy uh, from a and University. Uh, we had many outstanding students to graduate from here, and they're in all professions, uh, doctors, lawyers, educators, uh, coaches, uh, writers, uh, and uh, too many to mention. Uh, the football players, basketball players stood out when they went to major universities. Uh, one of our outstanding coaches was Herman Boone of uh, Remember the Titans fame. And a lot of the outstanding players like uh, Peter Saunders from years ago, Harold Joyner, who went to North Carolina College and played football, uh, people like Ricky Lanier, uh, Braxton Speller. There was a baseball team during that time, and uh, the team stood out. The basketball teams, Tony Bagley, Franklin Tip, everything. And during that time, a lot of the major universities were not accepting African Americans, but Rick Lanier uh, went to the University of North Carolina as a quarterback, and of course, uh, it didn't work out. They put, they made him a receiver, and then we had uh, uh, other players who went to colleges uh, and broke many records. Jack Johnson, who went to Fayetteville State, Richard Armstrong, who went to A and T University, and uh, there were so many that it's hard to mention. But all of these players did well when they went to school. David Shepard went to Gifford University and broke all kind of records. I'm standing here uh, where it used to be a Rosenwald school. This was part of E.J. Hayes. The agriculture teacher, Richard Broadnax, taught classes here. And uh, there was English and math and other courses taught back here. The school was torn down. Well, part of it was because my father bought the back part and moved it across the street for a rental property. But a lot went on here in this Rosenwald school, which came about because in 1917, uh, Rosenwald, who was president of Sears and Roebuck, decided to build schools throughout the South for African-American students. And, and that's when he decided to build this school on this site for the African-American children in Martin County. Now, when I went to school here, my house was over there, so all I had to do was cross the street and come to school. Uh, I graduated in 1964. Okay, over here, we have the library. This is where Ms. Uh, Mrs. Blair was a librarian. 
and uh, most of the teachers were here throughout the whole time uh, during my education and 12 years at E.J. Hayes School. Uh, this is the stage where students participated in plays because E.J. Hayes had a drama club which was rated number one. They also had a glee club and a choir. Uh, down further, As you see, there's now a parking lot for teachers down at the elementary school. That wasn't there when we were playing football. So, so this practice field was a whole lot larger. Now, eventually Coach Boone had us running to the river and back to get us in condition. Most of the players were satisfied with just running around this field for 10 times. When I was in elementary school, they had something called May Day, where students would wrap the maypole. And uh, they had activities all day. Nobody went to class. And they were out here, and parents would come out here and sell uh, food. Uh, they would sell apple jacks, potato salad, and crackers, and a whole lot of other things took place here during May Day. All of that ceased to exist after the years went by. This is where the school buses parked. And there was a lot of buses out here. They came from all around the county. Uh, uh, one or two buses came from the Darden area. Uh, they passed Janesville High School uh, and came to this black school. Of course, if things were integrated during that time, they would have stopped in Janesville instead of coming all the way from Darden to Williamson to go to school. The buses were packed with students from the Darden area. And once they got here, they still did well. They participated in things. Uh, it was hard for some of them to get home after practice because they participated in sports and other things at school. And sometimes teachers would have to take them home. This is where E.J. Hayes played football. Uh, I'm a coach Herman Boone. This is where I played when I played football for E.J. Hayes High School. We played on the Friday nights when the white school was out of town. The next week, we would go out of town so they could play a home game. This is where the bands performed when other black schools came. We had tremendous uh, entertainment from other black schools. When other black schools, high schools, would come here and play football, we were entertained by some of the greatest bands in North Carolina. And this is where Herman Boone won many games while he was here for approximately uh, seven years. About seven years, we played football here. The goalpost was located uh, right over there. And as you can see now, this is, this is a baseball field. Since it was during the time of uh, segregation, the games were so exciting. White people used to stand around this fence and look at the games. And uh, as the years went by, they eventually started going inside and sitting there with the rest of the fans looking at the games. But if, uh, at first, they would stand around and look at the football teams that E.J. Hayes had. Uh, this is the dressing room for the E.J. Hayes Tigers. This is where we came and got ready to play football. As you can see, it's now a baseball field, and the name of the high school is Riverside, which was once Williamson High School. Because of the closing of Beargrass High School and Janesville High School, they are no longer called the Tigers. Of course, uh, during the old days, the white school had green and white, and when they integrated, they kept the gold from E.J. Hayes. Their colors were blue and gold. And uh, for years, Winston High School colors were green and gold. But last year, that ended because of the closure. Of Lambert and Jamesville 
And now the high school in Williamson is called Riverside. We are now at the corner of Center Street and Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. This is the area where the first um, march in Williamson took place. They marched from an area located over here uh, where this street now exists. Uh, at that time, there was no street that continues through this area. This is where the church was actually located. It was a tent church, and it was located right where we are right here. Uh, they have now since built a church over here to replace the old tent church. I'm here at Green Memorial Church in Williamson, North Carolina. Uh, when the Civil Rights Movement started, this is where most of our meetings were held. Uh, we would go inside, uh, sing freedom songs, and after a while we would say a prayer, and then we would get in twos and leave this church and go downtown integrate bike establishments, to sing and pray in front of uh, the post office and city hall. It was here that uh, one night a police officer came in with his gun out uh, and we had to stop doing what we were doing. And it was here that Y.T. Walker and various other civil rights leaders came. It was here <coughs> that Golden Franks uh, he was uh, from Edenton, North Carolina. He worked with the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. During that time, we had SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and of course, you know, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they were active also. So all of these people would come to Williamson and teach us about nonviolence. And of course, they needed young people in the movement, and this is where the teenagers from E.J. Hayes participated in the demonstrations uh, during the summer of 1963. Sarah Small was also one of our leaders, uh, Mary Lou Mobley, uh, Ella Mae Harmon, those were some of the adults that helped us out, and of course, uh, special thanks goes out to a deacon in this church named uh, Dawson Speller, he said a prayer every night before we left and went downtown, which ended up in our being arrested. As we marched downtown, uh, I was told that people had guns in the houses, in which I'm looking at when we walk up the steps, because they thought uh, we were going to do something. But most of those houses, the man in the house had a gun. And back to Dawson Speller's, his prayers were so long. He included everybody. We had already worked up ourselves to leave this church and march. And he prayed sometimes what seemed like five minutes or longer. He prayed for everybody. And evidently, those prayers helped us. Uh, he lived to get 90-some years old. He just died a few years ago. And this movement started over 40 years ago. 
1963. For the civil rights movement, uh, uh, we were here singing songs and praying uh, here beneath the flag in front of the post office and a large crowd of white people gathered and somebody came from uh, this house with a baseball bat and beat a black man severely. Uh, I had already braced myself for a beating, meaning that I was on my knees uh, praying and singing. But nothing never happened. I was lucky that day God was on my side. But I feel sorry for the, the black man that was uh, beaten with that baseball bat. I, when I finally saw him the next day, he had bandages all around his head. But this is one of the prices we had to pay during that time when we were marching up and down Main Street in Williamson, North Carolina. I'm here in the National Guard Army in Williamson, North Carolina. During the Civil Rights Movement, a known segregationist came here to speak at the armory here. A friend of mine and I decided to come. And it really didn't make sense. But as the Civil Rights Movement went on, we were becoming braver and braver. And when another friend found out that we were coming, he decided to come too. So we came, and of course they stared at us. And little did we know, after we left, that our friend had a gun. My career would have been messed up, and my friend's career. He's a district attorney now in Fayetteville, and of course I taught school for many years. And sometimes we think about what could have happened if, uh, if a gun had been found that day on our friend. Carolina and during the civil rights movement this is where we used to come and sing freedom songs and pray we would get on these steps just like we were in a chorus and my sister Jackie would be out front directing us one night while we were here I was on the back row and white heifers were spitting on me as I uh, took part in the singing and the praying my uh, collar was so wet with saliva you could ring it out. But I kept right on until we stopped. It was here where Jackie, who was out front, would be looking up there and she saw the mayor peeping at us while we were singing. So she put his name in a song called Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around. Uh, the mayor during that time was Mayor Green. And Jackie saw him peeping out of the window and she put his name in that song while we were singing. Of course, the streets were loaded with white hecklers, and at one time we were expecting a lot of violence, and the highway patrol came from various places in North Carolina and lined the streets one night on both sides to protect us from white hecklers who meant harm. And that's when uh, some of the whites couldn't understand and they thought their own race was turning against them. I heard one or two say that. Our own race is turning against us. And this is when the white ministers from Boston came. And of course they uh, were met with violence also. Some of them were beaten to a bloody mess uh, when they came from Boston. And they went to jail just like we did. Uh, this led to some people when they went back to Boston, going back to Boston to live. Sarah Small and her family went, and uh, many other people from Williamson went to Boston, Boston, Massachusetts, after those people came here to help us. I'm standing in front of the Williamson Courthouse. Uh, I can see 
my friends sitting on these rails waiting to be tried for uh, demonstrations that were held uh, in the civil rights movement in Williamson. The courthouse was crowded. And uh, these young children were waiting to uh, go to court because they were born in various white establishments trying to do away with Jim Crow. It was here that my sister and I, Jackie, were involved in a major court case in which we tried to convict a white man for pulling a gun on us as we tried to integrate a local laundromat. It was here where the whites would be on one side and blacks on the other side. Years ago, they used to have a balcony. I'm now standing at the back of the Williamson Courthouse. Uh, there used to be a jail here, but the jail was torn down, and now they have a jail in Bertie County. But back during the 50s and the 60s, people were locked up in the second story area here. The jail was back here. And during the Civil Rights Movement, this is where my friends and I, uh, my sister, would be locked up. They had a quarters for women and a quarters for men. And when we went, to jail, of course, there were some people in there. People with nicknames that I can't forget. There was a guy called Bass Horn. There was a lady called String Bean. And, uh, and uh, a few other people. And when they saw us, it, they wondered, what did you all do? Uh, why are you all in here? They didn't understand what was going on uh, around the country. So as we went to jail, uh, and people found out about it, Eventually, they would help us, and the jails ended up uh, full. Uh, in fact, people brought us cakes and pies, uh, radios, and, and really, we had fun okay. in jail. But after a while, it wasn't long before the authorities did away with all of that good time. And they didn't allow people to bring us cakes and pies and radios. Now, it wasn't long before we were released, of course. People in the community were staying out bonds. Uh, people that were self-employed. People that had jobs didn't want anything to do with the movement because they feared losing their jobs. But as we walked out, with so many of us, some of those that were in jail for other crimes walked out with us. And they were able to become free because they got in line with us as we walked out. Uh, people like String Bean and Bass Horn, uh, they walked out with us and probably stayed out the rest of the time and then served their center. Uh, now, one day, it was so hot while we were in jail. Uh, it was 15 of us in a cell meant for just one or two. Uh, I stayed on the cement floor to stay cool. It was hot in the jail, and that led to some people thinking that the heat was cut on. I don't think the heat was cut on. Uh, maybe it was, but I think it was just a hot day. So as soon as we got out, it wasn't long before we would demonstrate again, integrate some establishment, and end up right back in jail. Some nights, uh, half of the football team would be locked up. And people in other groups at the, at the school, and they would get bonded out just in time for a football game. I'm now standing in front of Griffin's Quick Lunch. Uh, back in 1963, this was the scene of the first sit-in. Uh, my sister Jackie, John Howard, Don Small, and Magella McIntyre went in here. We were teenagers, and this was the white entrance uh, for Griffin's Quick Line. Uh, people held up chairs and bottles against our heads and threatened us uh, severely until the owner came and said, uh, don't hurt them, don't hit them. That's what they want you to do. So the police came, and all of us were arrested. This was the first major civil rights incident in Williamston. with this establishment, and it was a whole lot different because most of the time the blacks would have to go in the back. At this restaurant, 
blacks would have to go in the front, which was not as good as the back, and the whites went in the back. So this is why uh, uh, this group of five decided to come here and integrate this place back in 1963. I'm now on Washington Street, and uh, none of these businesses were here during that time when I decided to walk up town. I wanted to take a break from going to jail uh, and just uh, rest a little bit. And as I was walking now Washington Street in this area right here, the owner of Griffin came out here. I was arrested just for walking down the street. So I assumed that he thought I was gonna uh, sit in or do something at his place of business in order to uh, help the movement or something. Because when those of us who went to jail a lot uh, would be seen, they always thought that we were gonna go into the white entrance of their businesses. So I was taken to jail on what I thought was the 4th of July. If it wasn't the 4th of July, it was somewhere close. Uh, I went to jail, and of course, uh, my father, Siren Bond Sr., eventually bonded me out. I'm now standing in front of the RNC restaurant. Back during the 50s and the 60s, people enjoyed coming here getting hamburgers. The original sign is still up there. As you can see, hamburgers cost 30 cents. Uh, white and black a lot enjoyed coming to this restaurant. The food was good. But African Americans had to come to this opening right here. They couldn't go inside. So as time went by, thanks to the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the door was open for African Americans, and for years they enjoyed eating inside. I'm now standing at what used to be Watts Theater. This is where people came to the movies. Uh, it was torn down in the 70s. Uh, it's here where African Americans would have to go upstairs and look at the movie, and the whites were downstairs. Uh, uh, you can see the imprint of the steps that we took as we went upstairs. Uh, these bushes are hiding some of it, but uh, African Americans would come here and go up to here and buy their ticket. They would buy their ticket here. And then they would go up the steps to the area in which they had to watch the movie. There are no bushes in this area, so you can see the imprint of the steps in this area right here. And once we got along here, we were in the place where we were supposed to be as we looked at the movie, uh, in the balcony. Over here you can see some steps also that we didn't use. This was for the managers and people to go up and check on us on this side. We never used this side. We never used this side here. But this is where we went to the movies uh, during my growing up. This was called Watts Theater. And when the Civil Rights Movement came, a group of blacks left uh, Reverend Carter's church on Sycamore Street, which is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. 
and we marched downtown in two to this area here to go to the movies downstairs. And as we tried to get in, of course, we were stopped. Jack and I were up front. Jack and I were up front and we had lines of black people behind us in twos demanding that they let us inside. And while that was going on, two white boys from a prominent family told Jack and I that we didn't have to do this as if we were gonna step out of the line. When we finally got back to church, one of the uh, black girls mentioned that in church. And of course that added to our glory because we were involved in the civil rights movement. Why would we stop? Because somebody said we could go inside, which was probably not true. It wasn't true. So we stayed there and eventually some of us were arrested. I'm now standing in front of a big car theater during the 60s. And the fifth is, this is where we came to the movie. Uh, it was owned by a local doctor, Dr. Brian, who named the movie after his son, Victor and Carl. It was called Dick Carr Theater. African Americans had to go upstairs again. We bought our tickets over there, and we went up to the top. I'm now standing in front of Legacy Drug Store. Uh, these owners were different from a lot of other white people that own businesses. Uh, so were the people at the RNC. Uh, they were nice people, but they went along with the status quo. And, uh, and, and they were trying to satisfy both races. So here, they allowed African Americans to go inside. But we couldn't sit on the stools that they had in front of the counter. Uh, we had to stay right at the front and order whatever we wanted. So it wasn't long before Jack and I and some of our friends would go in and take a seat. And we were not arrested here. We were not arrested here uh, for taking a seat because, like I say, the owners were understanding what we were trying to do and they were still trying to satisfy uh, the whites and the blacks as well. But we weren't supposed to sit down on those stools. It was about 15 stools in a row. And like I say, we had to stand at this counter where the chewing gum and other little things were. We couldn't go back in the major park. Now, to bring this up again, the owners at the RNC were also what you might call fair people. But they went along with this status quo. Here at the old Martin General Hospital in Williamson, North Carolina, it was here that uh, African Americans and white alike were treated for various illnesses. Uh, one floor was for black and one floor was for white. I'm not sure which was the black uh, floor or the white floor. Uh, uh, this was our hospital for many years until they built a new one on the other side of town. I'm now standing in front of what used to be a laundromat. White people went in the front, and black people had to go through that door. When the Civil Rights Movement was dying down in Williamson, I asked my sister Jackie about going to the white section of this laundromat. And she said, okay. She was 15 years old and I was 16, so we decided to come here and integrate this front part of this laundromat. Uh, as we went inside, the white women that were watching called their husbands. And before you knew it, all of them were gathered around trying to hurt us and get us out of this part of the laundromat. The back part was filthy. The front part had carpet, air conditioning, but back here there was no such air conditioning or no modern conveniences, just some place to wash your clothes. So before long, the police came, well, before the police came, uh, one of our friends, Ben Scott, came by and saw that we were in trouble. And he started a, uh, 
when Jack and I went in the front part of this laundromat, uh, the women inside had called their husbands, and the husbands came here to start a confrontation. And when they did, of course, the police was on their way too. But before all of that happened, a friend of ours named Ben Scott came by, and he knew we were in trouble, and he started a fist fight with the husbands of those women in the laundromat. And uh, Ben reminded us of the Ali Shuffle. He was being fancy with his steps and uh, jabbing at those uh, white men who came here to cause a problem. Uh, eventually, he ran away and went to the bus station and made it safely to Stafford, Connecticut. By that time, the police came because they were called also there was a white only sign up here with some white teenage boys tore down and put in my truck. And when the police came, well, before the police came, a cook from Griffin's Quick Lunch, which is right over there, came over here with a gun and pointed it directly at my sister and I. And by the time the police came, he had already gone back over there to Griffin's Quick Lunch. So when the police came, my sister and I were arrested for trespassing. There was another charge uh, hooked on to my charge, and that was destroying property because of the white only sign. So after time went by, I told Jackie, we need to get a warrant out on the white man that came over here and pulled a gun on us. And she said, okay, Mickey, Okay, we'll go get a warrant out. Little did we know that black people didn't get warrants out on white people. So we went down to the uh, magistrate's office and he was surprised that we were trying to get a warrant out on a white man for assault with a deadly weapon. So eventually he went on and gave us the warrant. Uh, maybe he wanted to see what was gonna happen. So we got a warrant out on uh, Zayf Biggs, the guy who pointed the gun at us. And then we had to go to court. And on that court day, the courthouse was packed with people. Whites on one side, blacks on the other. Because during segregation, whites would sit on one side anyway and blacks on the other. If the whites needed a seat and there was one available on the black side, they could sit over there. But now the same situation occurs. If a black person needs a seat in the court, then they can sit on the white side regardless. Same thing about the buses and the Rosa Parks situation. So as court started, all of us went to the witness stand. Jackie and myself, and the other people involved, they called the police and called the husbands and everybody. And after testifying, uh, of course, we thought we had a case that we were a lot of anxiety win. and hope for people, especially the black side of the courtroom. They were on our side. Of course, you know, the whites that were there, they were hoping we would lose the case. So as the case went on, the prosecutor held up a gun and asked Jackie if that was a gun that Zell Biggs pulled on her and her brother. And she jumped up and said, that's it. And the prosecutor said, Your Honor, this is a toy. And the black people were sad and the white people rejoiced. Of course, you know, there's still a law against using something that looks like a weapon. I'm not saying that the gun wasn't real. It looked real to us. It looked like a gun. So maybe that toy was inserted at the last moment or that was their way of winning. But of course, you know, you can rob banks. You can break out of jail with a, a toy pistol. So that's the way I look at it. He still could have been charged. But the case was over. He was found not guilty. Okay? Now those charges that we had, we were found guilty. And they're now in the courthouse and I can gladly say it didn't go against me getting jobs. It didn't hurt nobody in the civil rights movement, I don't think. And a few years ago, I noticed that they erased some of those charges 
against people that participated in the civil rights movement. Standing here at the bus station uh, in Williamson, North Carolina, uh, during the days of segregation, this was the black side over here, and this was the white side. Uh, uh, blacks would wait over here for the bus, and whites would wait over there. On the inside, they had black bathrooms. On the other side, they had white bathrooms. And whenever we ordered a sandwich or something or something to drink, we had to stay on this side. And there was a way to get over there, but nobody ever went over there. Uh, it was here after graduation from E.J. Hayes. Uh, the bus station would be filled with blacks going north to look for jobs. Uh, there were no opportunities here for them. So after graduation or the next day, this bus station was packed with black people going to Stanford, Connecticut, or Brooklyn, New York, or somewhere else in the north to get jobs. And that's why today, as I consider myself lucky being a resident of Williamson and not having to go any place, uh, most of my uh, classmates live in other areas because uh, the opportunities, and they're making their livelihood in other states because of what took place years ago. Uh, as I look around Williamson, I see probably two or three of my classmates that are still here. Uh, during holidays, most of them come home and we get together and talk about the days at E.J. Hayes.